Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing United Microelectronics stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. United Microelectronics is a foundry semiconductor company. Foundry means it manufactures chips for other companies. Taiwan Semiconductor is the largest foundry in the world. Fabless means the company outsources manufacturing of its silicon wafers or chips to companies like UMC. Fab is short for fabrication, which is just another word for manufacturing. NVIDIA, Broadcom, and Qualcomm are some of the world's largest fabless companies. In 1995, UMC changed its business model from a fabless company to a pure play foundry. UMC is Taiwan's first semiconductor company. It was the result of a spin-off from the Industrial Technology Research Institute, which is a government-sponsored entity. This company has factories in Taiwan, Singapore, China, and Japan. It is a large supplier to the automotive industry. The company is headquartered in Sinshu City, Taiwan, and was founded in 1980. The company trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, and Taiwan Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 26 billion market cap. They're trading at 9.55 a share, and they have 2.8 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They have healthy and consistent free cash flow each year, a little over $1 billion a year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that goes up a lot from 117 million to 1.6 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that also grows nicely from 5.4 billion to 7.2 billion. This is the company's income statement. And all these numbers are in Taiwanese dollars. All the numbers in my Excel model are converted to US dollars. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to manufacture the semiconductor chips is part of cost of revenue. That includes cost of labor and cost of materials. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that almost tripled from 23 billion to 60 billion. Below that is our operating expenses. Depreciation is a big operating expense for this company. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. And that grew about 7x from 5.5 billion to 39 billion. They spent 1.8 billion of interest on their debt, which is 1 billion lower than 2018. And below that is other income or expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. So their net income was really inflated due to this $11.5 billion in other income or expenses. This is likely the gain on the sale of one of its business divisions. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. As you get further down the income statement, the growth gets more exaggerated. Their revenue grew less than 50% from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Their gross profit nearly tripled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Their operating income grew 7x, and their net income grew about 12 or 13x. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. This is the third quarter of 2021 and the third quarter of 2020. This is the third quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2021. Their revenue increased from $1.6 billion to $2 billion. They provide all their financials in US dollars and their local currency. Operating expenses of $1.3 billion and gross profit of $738 million. Their gross margins are 37%, which is gross profit over revenue. That's a lot worse than their industry. The median in the industry is 48%, the average is 44%. But their gross margins improved a lot from last year. Last year it was 22%, now it's 37%. In the second quarter of 2021, it was 31%. Below gross profit is their operating expenses, 44 million in marketing, 75 million in G&A, 119 million in R&D, 
R&D is big for this company because they're always trying to improve their current products or come up with new ones. So their operating income is 544 million, more than double last year of 256 million. And their operating margins grew a lot from 16% to 27%. And their net income also grew a lot from 324 million to 623 million. Their net profit margins went from 20% to 31%. And that 31% net profit margin crushes their industry. The median is 10%, the average is negative 1%. Here's a breakdown of where their chip sales are. 46% in communication, 27% in consumer, 17% in computer, and 10% in other. Two thirds of their revenue is from Asia, 22% from North America, 7% in Europe, and 6% in Japan. They're running at max capacity. Their utilization is 100%. In the third quarter of 2020 was 97%. Because there's so much semiconductor demand these days, all foundries are at max capacity. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you can see they generate lots of cash flow from 51 billion to 80 billion. Operating cash flow is the cash that's remaining after paying all your day-to-day -day expenses. They spend a lot of money in CapEx because that's what they do in manufacturing. So they have to buy a lot of factories and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do pay a pretty good dividend with the free cash flow. They also buy back stocks, 6 billion, 3 billion, and 1.7 billion. They did add a little stock as well, 2.2 billion and 1.7 billion. Overall, they're issuing a similar amount of debt as they're paying down. They issued 50 billion in the trailing 12 months, paid down 39 billion. But in 2020, they issued 30 billion, paid down 45 billion. This is the statement of cash flows from their quarterly report, the first nine months of 2021. And these are in US dollars. There are three parts to the statement of cash flows, operating, investing, and financing. Operating cash flow starts with your net income of 1.6 billion. We add back depreciation and amortization, and then there's some other smaller adjustments. Even though they reported an accounting profit of 1.6 billion, they actually generated 2.3 billion of cash flow. In their investing section, they spent 1.2 billion in PP&A. It looks like they spent 66 million in a business acquisition. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 1.8 billion. In their financing section, they paid down 300 million on short-term loans. They added 750 million of debt. They added another 500 million of debt. They paid down 336 million of debt and they paid out over $700 million in dividends. So in their financing section, they had a cash inflow of 220 million. This is the equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They have 9.2 billion of equity and this is in US dollars. They raised 6 billion from selling their business and they profited 3.2 billion from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure, 9.3 billion of equity, 2 billion of debt. They're 82% equity, 18% debt. And they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 3.3 billion of cash left over. And I gave them the highest whack to be conservative, 7.8%. And Taiwan as a country is a fairly low credit risk. They have the fourth highest Moody's rating. AAA is the highest, United States is AAA, then AA1, AA2, and AA3. 7.8% is the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated a little over three years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past 2024, that's 38 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $35 billion. We divide that by 2.8 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $13. They're trading at $9.55, so they're trading at a 25% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Their revenue is projected to increase 10%, so I grew their revenue 10% a year for the next few years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers and I divided by these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 20%, so I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 20%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. The website Simply Wall Street values the company at $14 a share. They're saying it's 35% undervalued. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. So this stock has been crushing it. 
look how low it was about two dollars and fifty cents two years ago and it went up 5x at one point but even now it's four times higher than it was two years ago lots of stocks have been selling off and declining but it looks like there was a little uptick today already they have a beta of 0.98 so the stock moves with the market it's pretty much flat the past 52 weeks but if you add in the dividend it's gone up while the S&P is up 17%, the 52 week low is $8, the high is $12.68. And the stock is on a decline trading well below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. So it looks like it's a great time to buy it. And this is a really popular stock. Nearly 14 million shares are traded each day. 5% of the shares are held by institutions and 1.7% of the shares are shorted. They pay an annual dividend. Their last dividend payment was in July, 29 cents which was double 2020's dividend and more than triple 2019's dividend. Their yield is almost 3%, which is half their net income, 68% of their free cash flow. Their industry pays a 1.3% dividend, so they're much higher than their industry. And analysts are really bullish on their stock, projecting their dividend to grow to 6.5%. Their dividend yield was almost 9% back in 2012. And it came down a lot in 2013 and then was pretty steady for a while. But you can see analysts are projecting their dividend to grow a lot. Look at their earnings per share. It was pretty flat for a few years. Then it dropped a lot in 2019, 2020. And then it just took off like a rocket ship in 2021. Their employee count is pretty much flat the past five years. They currently employ 20,000 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be really happy at $51,000 today. That's an 18% annual return. But if you invested $10,000 10 years ago, your investment would have gone nowhere for eight years. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the people would have sold off well before eight years. But patience is a virtue, and the people who waited out would have been handsomely rewarded. The general public owns 63% of the stock, institutions 29%, private companies 5%, and public companies 2.3%. Insiders only 0.6%. BlackRock is the biggest shareholder, 5.4%, 675 million shares. Then Vanguard, a Taiwanese investment fund, owns 3.5%. Then Silicon Integrated Systems, 2.3%, and Morgan Stanley, 1.9%. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a good PE at 17, that's stock price over earnings per share. That's better than a market median and a lot better than a market average. Price of sales is pretty good at 3.7. That means investors are paying $3.70 for $1 revenue and a good price to book of 2.9. Let's look at their non-current assets, 2.3 billion of investments, 4.5 billion of PP&E, and 260 million of right of use assets. Right of use is when you finance or lease an asset that is owned by another company. They have a really good return on investor capital of 19%. They can easily cover their interest payments with their operating income. They have a great ROE at 17%. They have a current ratio of 2.5, so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets two and a half times, and a quick ratio of 2.2. Let's look at their current assets, 4 billion of cash, 1.2 billion of receivables. This is how much other companies owe UMC, 800 million of inventory and 1.5 billion of other. Let's look at their current liabilities, 1.3 billion of payables. This is how much money UMC owes other companies. 800 million of debt and 800 million of other. Their trailing 12 month free cash flow is 1.2 billion. They have 4.6 billion of working capital and their annual dividend payment is almost 800 million. So they have nearly $5 billion of funding. So the company is well capitalized. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 68 companies in the same industry as UMC. And these are the top 17 by market cap. UMC spends more than average in CapEx, which makes sense because they're a foundry. They have a better debt to equity ratio than average. They pay a better dividend than average. Their free cash flow is lower than average, but they are smaller than the average company. Their market cap is 26 billion, the average is 40 billion. And there's some massive companies in this industry, well over 100 billion market cap. But their price multiples are really good. That's how you equalize companies by looking at their price multiples. Their price to book is a lot better than average. Also their price to earnings is 17, average is 36. 
a good price to free cash flow relative to average and price to book a lot better than average. Their revenue is higher than the average company. That's why they have such a good price to sales ratio. The three year revenue annual growth rate is 8%, they're 6%. So they're not growing as much as the average company. And their ROA and ROE are much better than average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 25% discount. Semiconductors is a really hot industry at this point. There's so much demand and there's a little less risk investing in a foundry because they don't really have to come up with new products like Nvidia. They just have to manufacture the products. This seems like a really solid company that could be a great long-term hold. Plus you receive that nice dividend. I ranked their free cash flow 6 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratio 7 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.